vital signs and measurements. So um, before the doctor goes in to see the patient, most likely the MA will take the vital signs and report if there's anything out of spec. All right, temperature, easy enough. So Fahrenheit and Celsius, you know the difference and how to convert? Yes. Pulse? What's a normal pulse rate? Isn't it 16 to, oh, that's respiration. 60 to 100? Yeah, 60 to 100. And then respiration is like 16 to 20 or something like that? Yeah, anywhere. 12 to 20. 12 to 20. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Blood pressure, so this is all from that review, if you, you recall from the review. So good. So blood pressure, 120 over 80. Pain, that's all relative. And then body measurements, height and weight, head circumference is usually for the little ones. Infants and, man, I think children they don't. Sometimes they'll actually do like a chest size as well, head and chest size, because you got to compare head and chest size for proper development. So if things are out of whack, it can cause problems. So why do people get fevers? What's the fever a sign of? Like an overheating or something? Yeah. yeah, yeah, if you're hyperthermic, so if you're out in the sun and you're exercising and you didn't drink water, yeah, that's one sign, hyperthermic. What's another sign of a fever if you have higher temperature? When do you usually get a fever? In the winter. What happens? Infection, right? So your body's fighting off the infection by trying to boil off the bacteria or boil off the virus. Right? So that's one sign. Um, let's see, pulse. Does your pulse go up or down if you are hot? If you're hot, it goes down, right? Are you sure? Oh, no. If you're hot, you're working out, it goes faster. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Because your body wants to circulate yeah. that blood and try to get it to the surface and get it out. All right, so some, some little indicators of the vital signs. And then we'll take at each visit, usually before the patient walks in. So for us in class, we're all going to use aliases. So don't use your real name. So just make up pseudonyms and uh, date of births that's similar to your date of birth that way we're not violating any HIPAA right no real patient names connected to the data all right of course these are included and we'll go over the standard values in the uh, the next slide as well wash your hands patient contact wear gloves as appropriate so if you're just touching non-broken skin, you don't have to wear any gloves. But if you are touching things that might be infectious, then put on your PPEs as prescribed. Fembre, that just means increased temperature. So that for me means fever. F is for fever. So that's how I remember the alliteration. Hyper is super fever. That's extra hot. And once you're about like 103, three plus 104 then permanent damage starts to sit in so um, yeah what happens is your cells right your cells start to literally break down the protein structures they they kind of melt they unravel so at increased temperature uh, certain stem cells can die in little boys that will lead them to become fatherless. Right? So sometimes a fever will cook the testes pretty much and then no more sperm production after that. A fembre, A in medical terminology is without. Yeah. So or non, yeah. So you don't have a fever. And if it's low, then you are hypo. Who requires more heat? A skinny person 
or a thick person. Yeah, because they have more body surface area to lose heat. However, for infants, babies, they have what's called black fat. You ever heard of that? Well, it's kind of brownish if you dissect it. So this fat turns into heat very fast because when the child's inside the mom's belly, it's perfect, it's about 100 degrees. But when they pop out, room temperature is about 70. So they have to adjust for that environmental change. Yeah, yeah, initially, initially. But once that black fat starts to break down and release heat, then yeah, they just need their onesie and that's about it. In the mouth, so that's under the tongue, oral, tympanic. So we're taking the middle ear temperature through the eardrum. Most uh, accurate is rectum because we want to get to the core of the body. Axillary, where is axillary? Where do you spray? Where do you spray axe deodorant? There you go. You remember. So if you had Med 100 with me, you had that uh, alliteration. So axillary is just under the arm, the armpit. So that one's probably the most convenient for uh, most patients, children, and adults. And then the one on the forehead, that one's the temporal scan. Normal temperature, about 98.6 for Fahrenheit, it's about 37. So that's average. Who's usually warmer, women or men? Um, is it women? Yeah, usually women a little warmer. And then um, so during ovulation, <laughs> yeah, stronger hearts. <laughs> <laughs> during ovulation, does the temperature dip or spike? Yeah, there's a little increase. So that means it's a range. You can be plus or minus probably one degree Fahrenheit. And you're fine. For degrees Celsius, you do plus or minus half a degree Celsius. And that's in range. So average. These are average numbers. And then depending on the site, right, the deeper to the core, the more accurate the temperature reading. Electronic thermometers, no longer working with mercury and glass that can break and cause damage. Uh, besides mercury, they also have alcohol thermometers. So digital is easy. Just make sure the battery is strong enough to be accurate. Tympanic is the eardrum. So for adults and children, children kind of have round faces, whereas adults have more oval elongated faces so that means their ears are positioned a little bit differently so to open up an adult's ear do you pull up or down up. up yeah and then for a child you want to pull down right and then for the temporal scanner you're going to contact it to the forehead and then you're going to move it across the forehead what you're trying to do is pass across the artery that's there so if you don't pass across the artery it's not gonna register a temperature. Is that both ways? Yeah, you have two uh, arteries on each side. Yeah, you have one artery on each side of your, mm -hmm. your head. Disposable. So under the tongue, oral ones, just make sure you know how to read it. So in this row, you have 96 and then in this row you have your fractions so if the dot is here then that's 96.0 so if your dot is here that's 97.2 right so you got to read it that way so if your dot is here all right then you want to read 98.6. This one would be 101.2. We'll try these as well. Oh, we have them. Um, I'll show you. 
uh, right after a lecture. You can take some with you, practice. Pretty fun. Not as accurate, but it's quick and easy, uh, disposable, portable. Measurements to the nearest tenth of degree, no problem. So the area, you have this thing that attached your tongue to the bottom of your mouth called the frenulum. So just on either side and have the patient close their mouth. If they eat, smoke, uh, add ice cream, coffee, anything that would change the temperature of their mouth, just have their mouth return back to normal temperature. Yeah, you can talk. You can. Um, actually, uh, you see those people who split their tongue in half? Uh -huh. So, yeah, they talk perfectly fine. Bifurcate their tongue. So, temporal scanner, very good. You uh, stated the appropriate method. So, for adults, you're going to pull it up and back. For children, you're going to pull down. And that's because oval face versus round face. Rectal temperature. Are you going to use the red tip thermometer or the green tip thermometer? Is it red? Yeah, <laughs> so very good. So if you're a nice, nice patient, we'll give you the red thermometer in your rectum and the green thermometer for your mouth. If we don't like you, be careful. <laughs> so position the patient on the left side, and that's because of the sigmoid colon in the rectum. And then that will allow the angle, the correct angle for insertion. Hold it in place, because if the patient moves or roll over, they may damage themselves. So that's a little bit dangerous. You don't want to perforate the rectum because there's a lot of blood vessels. No, hemorrhoids is, is varicose veins, but if you puncture blood vessels, it's going to be a lot of bleeding, a lot of blood. Can you stop using your rectum? No. So that means every 24 hours or so, it's going to have a little irritation, a reminder. Of that that nurse or MA that didn't hold the thermometer in place. All right, where do you spray Axe under, under your armpit? So easy for most patients, and it's pretty good, pretty accurate on most cases. Temporal scanner. So contact the forehead, scan it over. It will give you a little beep once it registers a temperature, and then that's it. You're done. Super easy. Uh, wipe it with alcohol once you're done. Pulse ties in with respiration. So we mentioned 60 to about 100. If it's below 60, what is that term for slow heart rate? Cardi. Cardi. Uh, yeah, so very good. So Tom Brady is a slow cardi, slow quarterback. And then if it is above 100, it is... Tacky, yeah, tack. tacky tack cardio. Yeah. So that's above 100. <laughs> now, if you are super, super healthy, would you have a low resting heart rate or a high resting heart rate? You have high. If you're healthy? Yeah. No. Oh, resting heart rate. Oh, low. Yeah, very low. So for super athletes, mm -hmm. they're in the 40s. That's crazy. Like uh, Lance Armstrong, while I was doing Tour de France, mm -hmm. he's in his 40s. That means for every one heartbeat, it's as twice as strong as a normal person's heartbeat. Respiration. So compensation. If there is low oxygen, your heart is going to say, you know what? I need more oxygen, so I have to beat faster. So your heart rate will go up. To compensate so that's why the two are linked together your heart will compensate until it can't compensate no more and then that's pretty much your process of starting to die 
cardiac output just remember output is over one minute right if they say like stroke volume that's one beat that's one volume after one beat so you take that stroke volume you multiply by the heart rate and you get the cardiac output and it's always over one minute Tacky above 100, Brady below 60. You can have weak, irregular, or if it's strong, document the quality of the pulse. And if it's too strong, they call that bounding. If you can actually like feel the pulse, like jumping out, jumping out of the body. Um, so measurement sites, your radial artery. Is that thumb side or pinky side? Thumb side. Yes, your radius is on your thumb side. So what I do is I use two fingers and I find the bone and then I slide my finger towards the inside, towards the medial side and where it dips right in that little groove, that's where the artery is. So I go from the outside, I slide my finger and then where that little divot is, that's where the uh, radial pulse is. One minute, or you can do 30 seconds and multiply by two, right? Or you can do 15 seconds and multiply by four, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever works for you, or you can do 20 seconds and multiply by three, right? So if it's a regular pulse, then yeah, you can do this method. But if it's irregular, if it's bounding, then you might have to count for the whole minute. Take pulse and respiration at the same time. Can you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not too bad. But you don't want to tell the patient yeah. that you're taking their breaths. Yeah, because as soon as you do, they'll start holding their breath. So for infant and small children, the brachial artery is appropriate. For larger children and adults, you probably want to use something else. For CPR, this is going to be the preferred site for infants. So it is in the upper arm. Apex. So the apex is at the tip. So in this case, the tip is at the top or bottom bottom of the heart so the ventricles they contract from the bottom up so they squeeze down at the bottom and then they work that contraction up so blood is pumped up and out of the ventricles so the atrium squeeze blood downward and the ventricles squeeze blood up not recommended is in your neck and that's because in your neck you have your built-in blood pressure monitors so as soon as you press down on the carotid artery the blood pressure monitor is going to detect that change and adjust accordingly right so you don't want to use the carotid artery femoral do you guys know where that is one of the largest ones it's by your leg here. yeah inside Inside. Papatil? Donde? It's uh, the front, right? Oh, the back. Okay, the back. Back of the knee. Front of the knee is uh, patellar. Right? Okay. Patellar is front of the knee. Back of the knee is papatil. Okay. Right? The back of the tibia. Like and then the on... Yeah, posterior. Like no, no. A lower. The lower leg. And then this is the top the of foot. the... So alternate sites if the other sites aren't available. Electronic measuring device. What's this thing measuring on the finger? The, um, yeah, 
the oxygen. So the oximeter, right? So that's measuring oxygen content. Most people are around you know, 95% or so. So if they're apoxic, then that number will go down. I think his is at about 93%. You as an MA, make sure you change fingers, right? And chart that you changed it because these patients are gonna get this cuff over their finger and they're gonna sweat and there's moisture. And if you don't change it every so often, Right, you take that thing off, and that fingernail might fall off, and then you might have a lovely, lovely odor as well. So the way it works is there's a little red light. Infrared light is below red, so it detects heat kind of, so it shines through. So if you ever had a sh uh, flashlight and you put your hand up, you see that most of the light goes through. And that's how it's able to measure oxygen based on that light intensity. Respiration, what's normal? 12 to 20, big range. Who's going to have higher respirations? Kids. Yeah, children. Children. So that means adults, you should have less. So one respiration is one inspiration and one expiration. So if you're counting one in, one out, one in, one out, that's okay. Just divide the number by two. Right, so if I see like, hey, they got a respiration of 39, then we know what happened, right? You just counted every in and out. It's supposed to be in, out, that's one. Right? So don't worry, just divide your super high number by two and you're fine. So as mentioned earlier, don't tell them what you're doing. So distract them with trying to measure the pulse. So look here while you're looking at their chest for chest rise. Stethoscope, so chest viewing the chest. But we're gonna listen. There's two different bellows, right? One is for low sounds, one is for deep sounds, right? High pitch sounds. Full minute, or you can do the trick. Do 30 seconds times two. And that's probably about as low as I would go with the respirations. Tacky, that is more than, Normal. more than 20, and then that's the same thing. Tacky, hyper. We should use hypo. Rouse, so with the stethoscope, if there's a lot of fluid, and it's usually thick fluid, that gives a popping sound, mm -hmm. right? So if you ever blew bubbles in uh, milk, right? It just makes bubble. Try it next time in syrup. Try to blow bubbles in syrup, it'll pop in your face, right? So that popping is what you're hearing, those rowel sounds. Um, the doctor may also do percussion. So they'll tap on the lungs to listen to the hollow sound or lack of hollow sound. Collapse lung, alteclasis. Ranchi, so similar to Rouse, but you have more of a flapping sound because that's the phlegm wiggling about. Um, other things that may cause apnea. Uh, sleep apnea is a big one. If anybody snores, most likely they stop breathing periodically. You are, I think they say, five times more likely to have a heart attack if you have sleep apnea. So get it checked out. Good quality sleep is very important. They're saying seven hours a day. So catch up on sleep, quality sleep. So if you're taking medication, alcohol, you knock out. I'm not sure if you're actually sleeping. So you usually wake up and you still feel tired, but you got to get good sleep. Blood pressure, what's normal? 120 over 80. So the important number is the diastolic number. If we can keep that low, then we're more happy. We're happier. That's because uh, the duration 
is a one to two ratio. The time you spend in systole versus diastole is only half the amount of time. So if you're in systole one second, your heart would be relaxed for two seconds. So this is the minimum amount of pressure that your arteries feel all the time. And one thing they'll figure out is your MAP, your medial or your mean arterial pressure. So the average of what your heart feels all the time. So here we got systolic, 117, diastolic, 74, oxygen, 92, and a pulse rate of 66. So these numbers are pretty good. I like these numbers. You want low blood pressure. You, oh, you want low yeah, blood pressure. you don't want super low because then you go into shock, right? Yeah. Blood wouldn't be circulating. But you don't want high blood pressure because that's the silent killer. It's damaging all the small blood vessels and the organs overall without giving you symptoms until you go blind, your kidney shut down, you die. Right? Millimeters of Hg. What is Hg? Mercury. So sometimes you might see inches of water. That's just different ways of measuring pressure. So don't be scared. Millimeters mercury, inches of water, that's just pressure. That's how we measure pressure. So systolic, systolic, that's the big number when the ventricles are contracting. Diastolic, the low number when they're relaxed and not putting pressure on the walls. Normal blood pressure. So what is high blood pressure? 140 over 90, right? So if you're getting close to this, because this is hypertensive, right? Pre-hypertensive is you're creeping up to these numbers. So this is hypertension. Silent killer, right? So stage one, stage two, depending on your symptoms. And usually you don't experience or feel any of those symptoms until it's too late. I'm getting these headaches all the time, and it's usually after I eat those salt and pepper chicken wings, you know. I have like 13 of them, and then I get this big headache, and I start to get dizzy and go blind a little bit. What's going on? And then the doctor checks you. Your blood pressure is super high. You ate all that MSG, right, on the salt and pepper chicken wings. That increased your blood pressure, and then you die. Essential. So that is a cardiovascular condition, whereas secondary is another um, problem is leading to hypertension. So for example, antidiuretic hormone. So this helps you maintain water. If your pituitary is producing too much ADH, your body's going to hold on to all that water, and all that water is going to stay in your blood. And that's going to increase blood pressure, right? Increase the volume of blood. So too much oxygen in the blood, that's going to give you blood pressure. What's ADH? Antidiuretic hormone. So this hormone keeps water in the body. So if your body has too much of it, you're going to keep too much water. Now the heart's kind of weird. The more you fill the heart, the more pressure gets built up and the harder it beats. So that means if you ha have a lot of blood volume, that means it's going to fill the heart up even more, overstretch it even more. And then just like a balloon, right, if you overstretch it, it has more power to then beat. So that's going to spike your blood pressure even more. What's viscosity? Yeah, so that's resistance to flow. For us, we can just call it how thick your blood is. Right? So one problem is with uh, the sickle cell trait. Right, You have these blood cells that are big and weirdly shaped, and then they get kind of clumpy, they get thick, if you are in low oxygen condition. 
So it's a catch-22. If I'm taking diuretics, I'm getting rid of all this extra water in my blood. But if I get rid of too much water in my blood, my blood gets too thick. So you have to have this balance. With low blood pressure, we really don't give you any meds or anything until it's super severe and you start to pass out all the time. Now, certain medications will cause what's called orthostatic hypotension. So when you stand up, right, those blood pressure monitors in your neck will sense that blood's been drained from your brain. So your heart compensates by beating a little bit quicker for a moment to get that blood back in your heart. But if you're taking drugs for high blood pressure, like beta blockers, right, you sit or laying down and you stand up quickly, all the blood drains from your brain, and that signal to your heart is blocked. Right? That signal from your brain that's saying, hey, we need more oxygen. Why don't you pump a little faster? The beta blocker blocks that signal, and you don't get the blood flow back to the head. So you got to train your patients. Get up very, very slowly. Pressure by hand measuring. So sphygmal mammometer. So that's the blood pressure cuff with the use of the stethoscope. So do you guys know how to take blood pressures? Have you guys done it before? Okay, so it's pretty easy. We'll watch some videos, but the most important thing is you're looking for the sounds. So there's gonna be a dial. So zero's down here, and as you increase the cuff, that pressure is gonna go up. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna let go of the valve so that pressure slowly goes away. So you build up pressure, and you want to go. You want to go about like, yeah, about 180. Right? Yeah. Any more, then you might cause a little bit of strain. So go about 180, maybe 200, and then as you let the blood pressure cuff go, that dial is going to move. And every time your heart beats, that dial's going to jump a little bit. All right. And you want to listen for the sounds. The first sounds you hear are going to be called the Kortikoff sounds. So as that dial right, slowly winds down as you relieve pressure, you'll hear the Kortikoff sounds. And it sounds like knocking. And then the knocking will get lighter. And then for a moment, it sounds like there's no sounds at all. And then the next sounds you hear will be a whooshing sound. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. So what you want to count is the first sign of knocking. That's what you want to look for. That is going to be the systolic. And then that's going to get a little bit lighter. And then you start hearing whooshing sounds. And then that last whooshing sound you hear is going to be the diastolic blood pressure. So we'll, we'll I'll, I'll pull up a video for us before we go into lab today. So everything is by two. So just uh, take a note of the calibrations for correct documentation. Nowadays, we can just use the electronic one. It could be a full arm one or just a wrist one. You won't see these too much anymore because of the laws for mercury, especially in California. So I don't think they make them anymore. Yeah, that's right. They don't make them anymore. So if you have them in your office, then you can use them until they break down and that's it. But they don't make them anymore. Calibrating, usually it's the electronic ones, the handheld ones, they stay pretty good. Amplify sounds. So you have bell and diaphragm. Which one's for low pitch sound? The diaphragm. Diaphragm, low. And that means the bell is for high. So chest sounds, right? You'll use the larger ends. 
but if you want to hear high pitched sounds like uh, intestinal sounds, right? Sometimes you you'll hear that squishing, that swooshing of fluids and liquids, gas through your intestines. You might want to use the bell. The cuff. Make sure it is of appropriate size. They do come small, medium. However, in our class, somehow the large and extra large one was walked away. Um, people use these to break into cars. Really? Yeah, you put the airbag in between the door and the car frame. You inflate it, and it's enough pressure to open it up for you to, to rob people. Papatory method is feeling. So this is by touch. So inflate the cuff. So usually, what is it? 140 over 90 is high blood pressure. So you just want to go above it. 180 to about 200. Place the cephoscope on the brachial. Thumb side or pinky side? Thumb side. Thumb side. There you go. Make sure it's on the thumb side. And then as you release the valve on the cuff, listen for the sound. Cork to cough. So that's that tapping sound. Then it gets softer and changes into whooshing sounds. So you want to record the first tapping sound and the last swooshing sound. Blood pressure. So things that might change it. Some patients have white coat anxiety. So most of the time, the blood pressure is fine. But once they walk into the exam room, they have anxiety and the blood pressure gets high. So for that case, the doctor might send them home with a blood pressure cuff and say, you know what, take your blood pressure in the morning, afternoon, and night. That way we can get a baseline. Obesity, high blood pressure or low blood pressure? Yeah, so we have the standard American diet. Too much sugar, too much refined carbs. Leads to obesity. Stress and anxiety? Going to change heart rate. So for mastectomy, so Angelina Jolie, I guess you got to use a different method. She has a double mastectomy. Any implants, avoid them. Orthostatic postural hypertension. So this is what I mentioned if a patient's on, uh, on meds and they stand up quickly. Their blood pressure drops. Older adults, similar. But for children, use just the smaller, smaller cuffs. Height and weight. The additional one for children is head circumference and chest. Do you guys know at what month the chest and head should equal? What do you mean what month? Yeah, what month? After how many months of age? Do they stop doing it? No, when the head and chest. So at birth, the head is bigger than the chest. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point, the chest... And the head is the same size. I think it's like supposed to be six months. So don't quote me on that. I think the uh, benchmark is at six months. So that's why they they measure head circumference and chest circumference. Every office visit, uh, height and weight to the quarter pound, and for height to the quarter inch as well, the, uh, the measuring, the measuring rod goes to every quarter inch. So have the patient put their heels all the way to the back and their back against the bar. And if you want, have them take a deep breath in and then hold here and you'll ask the patient to step off. That way you can read. Uh, the measurement. Body mass index might be outdated. It's 
especially for our current body trends. So this has been in effect 100, 100 years, hundreds of years. So for me, I just measured myself. I wasn't, so, I wasn't happy. I put on an extra seven pounds of belly weight. So I'm 5'8". That was a hundred and yeah, right there. So for me, I'm right at the border of a healthy weight and being overweight. So I'm saying, you know what? Just change this. Just make us all happier. Yeah. It's like with clothes. It's, it's like with clothes, you know. <laughs> I'm like a size nine, but on the tag, what did they put? They put six. I'm happy. We're all happy. <laughs> but um. This is also bad for someone who's super healthy because if I put on 20 pounds of muscle, mm -hmm. right now I'm definitely overweight, but I'm healthy. So you have to look at the patient overall. Who gets to have a higher MBI or BMI? I guess women. Me. Other measurements, diameter of limbs, so legs, arms, especially if um, obesity or wasting condition. Uh, moles. All right. Take a photo. I'm molded. Yeah. Do you do your mole check? So for older adults, they have to do mole check on each other. But if you take a photo, sometimes you can't tell. Like freckles, mm -hmm. moles, because that might be signs of cancer if they change oh, yeah. shape, get bigger or smaller, right? So melanoma. So with the mole check, make sure if this is the mole that you have that ruler next to it in the photo. And we take a picture of the mole mm -hmm. and the ruler. That way we know the approximate size. So if you just give me pictures of a mole after a mole, I don't know if it got bigger or smaller. Um, chest circumference, we talked about for children. That's so they can compare it to the head. Abdominal girth during uh, pregnancy, right? They take measurements. All right, not too bad. Let's head off to lab. So grab the documentation sheet right there in front of you guys. Do a quick break. If you guys need one, we'll grab the materials and we'll do the vitals.